Thank you, Dr. Little. Um, members of the board, um, tonight we bring you first reading of the Centerville Elementary School attendance lines. Um, again, we, we will bring uh, this back to the board for two additional readings. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a little while. Uh, but as you recall, Centerville Elementary School is being constructed on Highway 1 uh, out in the Gilbert community, and we're excited about that facility opening in August. And so uh, we'll, we need to uh, start the process of, of redrawing lines uh, to populate that facility. So um, as we do this, uh, this is a, a, I hate to say it, but it's a pretty standard practice in Lexington School District 1. Um, as, we, as we grow and, and build new facilities, we need to... Uh, redistribute students into those facilities. So we have some considerations that we look at when we do that. Um, obviously, we want to try to use our facilities as efficiently as possible. Um, we want to minimize uh, the division of subdivisions where possible. Uh, as we draw lines, we try to not split up neighborhoods um, so that students in, uh, can go to school with their neighbors. Um, we, we do consider balance of, uh, for student demographics. Um, and we, we really want to allow for future student growth in our permanent facilities, so we try not to um, max out any given facility, if possible, when we draw the lines. And we do consider transportation patterns uh, for efficient and safe uh, student transportation. And then we, we try to utilize major road um, ways or, or natural boundaries like creeks or streams uh, where possible so that the lines can um, be easily um, understood and seen by the community. So uh, again, these are all considerations that we look at when we when we go to draw lines. Uh, sometimes things don't always work out and we have to give up on some of these to to make uh, things work out, but but we do start um, with these in mind. And so I just want to take a, a, a quick step back in time uh, for a second and, and have you think about um, the Lexington attendance area in the uh, 70s, early 70s, and the Pelion attendance area really in the early 2000s. Uh, and I wanna, I wanna point out a few things to you. So looking at the Lexington attendance area, this is actually the current um, River Bluff, Lexington, and White Knoll High School attendance areas, which back in the 70s, this all represented Lexington High School, uh, the Lexington High School attendance area. And that's about a third of our district. Um, and you can see, uh, Today, we have 14 elementary schools uh, serving that, uh, those communities. And it, at the time in the, in the early 70s, there were two elementary schools, uh, Oak Grove Elementary and then Lexington Elementary were over in this area um, serving all of that, uh, that uh, Lexington High School attendance area. So about a third of the district was being served at that time by two um, elementary schools. And of course, now you can see what has happened over, over time, the growth in the Lexington community and White Knoll and River Bluff communities has really driven us to um, add additional elementary schools. And in fact, um, in our uh, 2018 referendum, we're actually gonna add an elementary school in this area and then one down here in this area. Um, so a lot of growth occurred in, over that period of time. Fast forward to the Pelion attendance area um, and up until the mid to, uh, 2000s when uh, Forts Pond opened up, um, this third of the, of the district, uh, which represented the Pelion High School attendance area, was all served by Pelion Elementary School. Um, and so uh, when Forts Pond Elementary opened up, we were able to divide um, that attendance area and, and feed two schools. And uh, so now Forts Pond Elementary and Pelion Elementary School um, uh, serve that community. And actually the schools themselves are, um, uh, you know, Pelion Elementary is right in here. and and Forts Pond's just on the other side of the line there. Um, so I, I say all that to tell you that the growth um, is coming and, and as, as that growth occurs, we end up um, needing to, to split up the, the communities to try to help shape that growth. And so looking at Centerville Elementary School, um, this is a, a rendering of the outside of the school there. Um, we're starting to see, see this is the first uh, step in shaping that growth and so this is the other third that we haven't talked about yet of our attendance areas, and, and um, this is the represents the Gilbert High School attendance boundary, and um, we're looking at Centerville Elementary School uh, right here off of Highway 1, and then uh, Gilbert Elementary, which um, is currently the Gilbert Primary School building, as you recall, it's um, K2 right now, and um, 
the current Gilbert Elementary School building is, is three through five. And, and so we will open um, Gilbert Elementary School as a um, K-3 through grade five um, elementary school. And so we'll have some pre-K services there uh, for some of our special education students. Um, and then Centerville Elementary will open as a K-4 through grade five uh, school. And the anticipated enrollment for these facilities um, you see there, Centerville at 705, um, and then Gilbert Elementary School at 816. Um, these are based on projections. Um, and so the, uh, it's pretty, uh, I won't say it's easy, but it's, it's, pretty, it's, a, it's more of, an, of a science when you're doing uh, middle and high school projections because most of the students are already in your system. Um, when you're doing elementary projections, it's a little, uh, a little more tricky because um, you, you have to project that kindergarten uh, cohort and um, not really sure how many of those students are going to show up until they're, you know, they're there. So uh, that becomes a little more challenging, but we, we do use historical data to do that. Um, and so we're projecting these two opening enrollments at 705 and 816. Uh, Centerville, as you recall, is being built uh, to house 1,000 students. Um, and Gilbert Elementary School comfortably will, will uh, well, I shouldn't say comfortably, but they'll be uh, packed pretty tight at about 875. Um, and so we, we want to try to, as you recall in our considerations, um, leave a little bit of room for growth in each of these, these communities. And uh, we also will be uh, repurposing the current Gilbert Elementary School facility uh, in the future. And so these um, early childhood programs will ultimately be relocated to that facility, uh, further uh, allowing for growth in, in these, two, um, these two schools. So let's take a quick uh, closer look at some of the, um, the information around this, this line. Uh, we've estimated some travel distances um, that uh, uh, you know, students might travel uh, for these areas. And so you see Centerville here in the green and so if you're on the northern end of the community, um, about 9.7 miles from this area, about four miles from, from here, and then about 8.8 .8 miles from here. Um, and then getting to Gilbert Elementary School from the furthest points in, in that attendance area, 12 and a half miles here, and then 10.6 miles here. Um, and as you recall, uh, the, you know, of course, these students are already driving uh, to get to this area um, to attend the schools as, as well. So. Um, just wanted to put that there for your perspective. And then we can zoom in a little bit on the actual attendance line so you can kind of get a feel for the roads involved. And so, um, of course, down here we have the, the Gilbert uh, Elementary uh, portion of the boundary. And then in the top here we have the Centerville portion. And so it starts out on the right-hand side at Wire Road. Um, and you can see that. And then we, we come in here to Louie Road. Um, and then Broad Street, and then we uh, take a left and come down Green Hills Drive, take another left and come down uh, Kraut Pond Way, and then um, picking up on the other side of the, um, the line here, uh, Kraut Pond Way continues down, and we cross Two Notch Road, um, pick up AC Balk Knight Road right here, and then come back up Camp Branch, and then follow Two Notch back out to the district boundary um, here at the end. And, and by doing that, um, that, you know, that produces the enrollments that, um, that I've shown in the projections there. Mr. Salters, can yes. you go back and talk about the, the nook for a little bit on AC Balk Night? Sure. Um, so th this area right here, um, there, there are some uh, a densely populated area of students um, right in this area. Uh, and that's why we have um, pulled this area out in, in, into Centerville. Um, and it, there's some, some students on each side of the road um, that, that help balance that, that enrollment for Centerville. So um, that's, that's why those are, um, are pulled up to that area. Um, looking at our instructional programs um, that will be offered at each school, of course, um, we've, we've talked about this previously, but immersion will be offered um, at both schools. Uh, so Spanish immersion. Spanish, right. Spanish immersion will be offered at both schools. Um, of course, there's an existing immersion program um, at Gilbert Primary and Gilbert Elementary School, and that'll be offered at both schools. Um, we'll have a, um, 
as I mentioned, a three-year-old and four-year-old offering at Gilbert Elementary School. That will continue. And then there'll be also be a four-year-old offering at Centerville Elementary School. Um, currently, we have no grandfathering planned uh, at this time. Uh, since all the rising fifth graders uh, that are affected by this will actually change their physical school location. Um, they will either go uh, back to the, the primary school building, which will be the elementary school, or they'll go to Centerville. So we haven't recommended any grandfathering um, in, in this process. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the three- and four-year-old programs will ultimately move to the new Early Childhood Center um, as it's uh, repurposed there in, in the future. Dr. Powers. Do you have a feel for the, the number of kids in that 3K and 4K? Just I'm trying to think about future capacity for those two elementary schools if those kids come out. Yeah, so there, there are, um, I think there are, on, and on e at any given time, there are about 40 four-year-olds on each campus, um, and there's two, two classes so of those, so um, there's actually like 80 kids that can be involved, okay. I think, total. Um, and then there's about, um, I'll just say 10 to 15 um, okay. students in the so three-year-old um, that, that can kind of float in two different classes. So, um, yeah, it's a relatively small group, but it, can, it could end up being, you know, uh, three, four classrooms at each building, um, which has a, has a pretty good impact. Um, so um, ultimately those will move to the Early Childhood Center, and, I, and those programs would ultimately ex be able to expand beyond what they are now once they're moved and, and aren't constrained by, by space. That's the point I was going to make. So when we move to the Early Childhood Center, the hope would be that then the Early Childhood programs begin to expand so we would be serving even more kids on that facility. Um, but for these are just the kids that are currently being served on our current campuses. We just have to weigh the budget consequences of that because right. the funding model is, I mean, we just got to process that. So. What's, what's a hopeful time frame for the early childhood facility to have kids in it? Uh, I, I think this, the time frame right now is two years. Um, we we're, you know, have to get out of the building, and then we have to do, go through a design and construction process. Um, but our instructional services team um, is doing some uh, research on what that center will look like um, and, and doing some planning. So that's really kind of year one once the facilities vacated, doing that planning and figuring out what it's going to look like, and then design construction the second year. Uh, some key dates I want to point out to you. Uh, obviously, tonight we're having first reading. Um, as our standard process, we um, take this information to the board first, and then we go out to the communities in, impacted um, and review the information. So we'll be having community input meetings at Gilbert Elementary on the 4th excuse me, in Gilbert Primary on the 5th. Then we'll uh, collect feedback from the community at those meetings and then also online. Uh, all that feedback will be shared with the board uh, and we will um, hear from you on, on changes that you might recommend making and um, based on the community feedback. We'll then have second reading, um, have another presentation at that time and also during, you know, between second and third reading, we'll also have the opportunity to have um, additional feedback uh, through a mechanism that our communications department establishes online. And uh, we'll go through that process and then bring uh, a third reading to the board for final action um, on the March regularly scheduled meeting. And so just want to also uh, remind the board um, that we are doing some renovations at um, the current primary school campus, which will obviously be uh, named Gilbert Elementary School once again. And uh, one of the things that you see in the rendering here is we, we uh, want to have a focal point for the campus. Um, this was a prototype plan that was built uh, in the early 80s. It's also been, it was built at uh, Pelion Elementary School and Red Bank Elementary School. And so one of the things that um, as we've noticed over the years from feedback is people don't really know where the main office is. And so we're trying to introduce some elements here that kind of say, uh, here's the front doors, come, you know, uh, come visit our school. Um, so that's one of the, the big things that, that's going to be taking place there. You see a number of things listed here that we're going to um, look to accomplish this summer um, and uh, really give the, the facility a nice, fresh, clean look. Um, a couple things I'd like to highlight for you 
Um, one is the um, updated library book collection. Um, we have really, uh, since we, when we opened Beachwood, we, we kind of started this process of opening our libraries um, at an exemplary status, and uh, they are graded by the State Department of Education. That has to deal with the number of books per student, um, the age of the collection. There's a number of factors involved in that metric. Um, but uh, we started there uh, to, with the goal of reaching exemplary status, which we did. And the, these two facilities will also be brought to exemplary status. And so um, we're going to um, take the collection that's at Gilbert Primary School, um, cull the books out that um, need to be culled, and then um, replenish with new books uh, to bring them up to um, exemplary. Um, the current Gilbert Elementary facility will take those books with them after they've called them out to Centerville, and those will be replenished and bring them up to exemplary. So both schools will have a mix of new books and existing books, um, but both will open at ex with an exemplary uh, rating in their, in their libraries. Obviously, uh, Gilbert Elementary will also have new classroom furniture. Recall that's um, happening across the district as part of our bond referendum. Um, there's furniture actually being installed today at, at Midway Elementary School. Uh, I think Carolina Springs Elementary might be next on the list. So we're making our rounds around the district with that. Um, and then also new playground equipment will be installed um, at Gilbert Elementary School. Uh, right now, with just being K-2, uh, they have some uh, needs for some upper grade level, elementary grade level equipment. And so we'll be addressing those needs as part of the, part of the renovation. And this is a, a difficult thing to, to look at here, but um, you can see this dark outline. That's actually the building footprint. One of the difficulties with uh, this campus is the lack of stacking room. Um, the park is, is up here. Gilbert Middle School is over here off this side. And this is Main Street. Um, <clears throat> and so now what uh, parents do is come in through the park and loop around uh, basically through the middle school and get into this um, parking lot this way. And we're going to create a stacking um, loop where we come in to the main entrance of the school and um, maneuver around the stacking drive here um, and then enter, enter to the front of the school. So that's one of the things that's really been a challenge on that campus. So we're going to extend that, that stacking there um, and, and allow folks to really kind of come in the, the, the front of the school and really uh, hopefully get out of using that park uh, entrance uh, because over the years there's, there's been some, um, you know, damage to the park by, by cars, just, you know, so many cars moving through there. So really trying to get everything back onto our, our property. So I'm uh, really excited about that improvement that will occur this summer. Um, with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have uh, regarding the, um, the rezoning. And, again, this is just first reading, so... Um, we'll have a lot of input over the next few months to get to a final um, final set of lines. I have a question about the stacking you just showed. How will that work with the bus loop? Uh, so the bus loop um, will be um, unaffected. I mean, it's, it's right here where they come in and they'll come around this way and then and make their way back out. So the stacking um, is separate from the bus loop. There was a, <clears throat> there's currently a small little U-shaped loop right here, <clears throat> excuse me, and that will go away. Okay. Um, so where will that go? Because special needs loads and unloads there. They, they do. Um, they will <laughs> most likely uh, load in the bus loop right here. Okay. I'm just curious, who redraws the lines for when we rezone? Who's involved in that process? Uh, who's involved in the pro of actually drawing the lines. Right. Uh, so we have a process where um, the operation staff, Mr. Warren, myself, um, work through uh, several iterations of, of lines, and we present those to SLT, um, and SLT discusses those different iterations and ideas, and uh, we meet with the school principals to get input at the, the school level. Um, and then we uh, come up with a, a scenario that we think uh, best fits the needs of the, the schools and the district and bring those to the school board for discussion. Okay. And then, obviously, we have community input and the process that I've just described. So <clears throat> it's really a, a multi-leveled approach. Um, 
a lot of people have their hands in it. Uh, our communication staff also plays a key role in um, the communication part of, of, of organizing the meetings, getting feedback, collecting that feedback, distributing it to the board. Don't you, you also use some of the county maps and the software from the county yeah, we, that we shows have a, subdivisions and number of houses sure. and roads and things like that? We have a, um, a very sophisticated uh, GIS software um, package that uh, Mr. Warren is an expert on, um, and that package ties into our county um, GIS, and, and those maps are uploaded. So every time new roads are put in, in the, into the county, we get updates on where those roads are, new subdivisions and that kind of thing. Um, and so, and that system ties directly into our, um, our power school student information system. So our, uh, information technology staff also plays a key role <clears throat> in that, that student data is transmitted into that system regularly. So we get updates and, um, so it's a really, a real team approach. Um, Mr. Salter, would you mind going back to one of the early slides, the one that has, um, shows the location of the two schools, um, and yeah, that's good. That one's good. Um, and kind of point out where, I know there are a couple uh, pretty large developments that are coming out of the ground right now. Show where those are in relationship to yeah, So there's a big development right right down here um, on Golden Jubilee, or right off of Golden Jubilee. <clears throat> um, How many houses is that one? That's several hundred homes, and there's, there's a number that are already built there. Um, so that's one neighborhood that um, is already coming out of the ground. There's another one that's that's right up here, kind of down uh, down the road, that's off of Highway One, that that's uh, beginning to to to, um, to come out of the ground. And so um, the, there's a lot of growth that's coming out this way. Obviously, uh, sewer and and water have come out 378, so you're starting to see some development along <clears throat> excuse me along 378, um, and uh, and then there'll there'll continue to be more development down Highway One as well. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Salsett, I'd like to just take a moment and thank you and your staff for the hard work that goes into this, not on just logistically, but you know, in the effort to make everyone happy. I know it's <laughs> hard to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, sir. And while we're here, I want to acknowledge Mr. Branham and Mr. Moody. They're the two principals associated with these two schools. If you gentlemen will stand up for just a minute. I know everybody knows you, but let's just... Because this, it is a lot to do this, and these two gentlemen are working very hard with their staff to make all this happen at the ground level. So thank you, too, for what you're doing. Thank you, Mr. Salters. And I, I would just point out that, believe it or not, this might be the easy part. Um, Mr. Stacy and the, the principals have the, the challenging part of getting everybody uh, staff once, once this happens. So I really appreciate all the work they're putting in to do that.